In case you didn't know, this video is a follow-up to last week's piece on Shinya Tsukamoto's first two professional films, The Phantom of Regular Size and The Adventure of Denshu Kozo. If you haven't already, be sure to check out part 1, which will be linked in the description. Otherwise, let's not waste any time and dive straight into today's subject, Shinya Tsukamoto's major debut, Tetsuo the Iron Man. In June 1989, at the Fanta Festival in Rome, Italy, this beast of a film was unleashed onto the scene. A month later, in July, Tetsuo hit Japanese screens, further cementing the young director's name at home. Thanks to these two quick releases, Tsukamoto began to garner not only a stronger following in Japan, but also attention on the global stage. In spite of the multitude of other films to his name, even today most moviegoers familiar with Tsukamoto were likely introduced to his work via Tetsuo which resulted from the film's early international success at Fanta Festival, which stemmed from his success at the PIA Festival a year prior. Tetsuo may still be part of what Tom Mess in his book Iron Man considers Tsukamoto's immature work, but it shows marked improvements over his two previous projects. First and foremost is the decision to shoot on 16mm film stock rather than 8mm. This lends the film a higher picture quality that's notably less grainy than Phantom or Denshu Kozo. What's more, the film's cinematography is more striking thanks to Tsukamoto's decision to produce the project in black and white rather than color. The film's sound design is also improved. The dubbing of what few lines of dialogue appear in the film are of higher quality, lending the film more cohesion. The sound effects are also much… meatier than their earlier counterparts. I mean, just listen to how visceral some of this is. And that's to say nothing of the soundtrack. The earlier projects had made use of songs played by Tomoruo Taguchi's punk band, as well as slightly modified versions of popular tracks. The former of these was thanks to the tracks being offered by Taguchi. The latter was to avoid copyright infringement. In Tetsuo, meanwhile, we find an original soundtrack of gritty, minimal electronica, which helps build the film's atmosphere. At times, it borders on something out of a Silent Hill game scored by Akira Yamaoka where the viewer isn't sure what's part of the music and what is supposed to be sound effects for the events off-screen. Tetsuo, as with the earlier films, began life as a short project. Originally, it was intended to run half an hour in length, but just kept expanding under the crew's feet. Tsukamoto saw the film as a marriage of his sci-fi loves since childhood, a helping of kaiju, a dash of David Cronenberg's The Fly, and a pinch of H.R. Geiger's design for the xenomorph all coalescing into Tsukamoto's new take on Toguchi's salaryman turned monster. Returning to older projects, Tsukamoto even incorporated elements from The Phantom of Regular Size, namely these scene transitions involving a head on TV emitting unhinged laughter echo scenes from the earlier film. In short, the film was meant to pay homage to where Tsukamoto had come from, both artistically and inspiration-wise. He just had so much to say that it kept running over time. In the end, the film was shot over a period of four months, again largely in Kei Fujiwara's house, which had earlier served as the basis for Denshu Kozo. That might sound like a lengthy shoot, but in total the production stretched past a year, coming in the end to encompass a full 18 months. This again might echo Takashi Miike's introduction to Tom Mess's book, in which he explains that he filmed something like 80 shots alongside Tsukamoto one day, where Tsukamoto, meanwhile, only bagged one shot that day. The production of Tetsuo took so long that the cast and crew kept dropping out, especially after photography. By the end of the 18 months, just Tsukamoto and Taguchi were left behind, slowly but surely working to see it completed. This time wasn't without trouble for the main two, though. At one point, Tsukamoto grew so frustrated that he considered burning the film stock and calling the whole thing a wash. This calls back to his childhood habit of destroying his artworks whenever his father would condescend about Tsukamoto's lack of skill. Thankfully, spurred on by the demands of adult life, Shinya refused to give in as he did when he was younger. This is a fancy way of saying that he was broke. He had quit his advertising job to pursue filmmaking properly and he was kicked out of his parents' house in turn. He had no fallback plan if Tetsuo was a failure, so he simply couldn't afford to let it crumble. In 1989, when Tetsuo was first unveiled to the world at large, audiences were shown a vision of Tsukamoto's new world. The film, more or less following the plot of the earlier Phantom, explores the life of a stressed-out salaryman played by Tomoruo Taguchi. 
The salaryman is pursued from a train station by a metal-clawed woman, again played by Nobu Kanaoka, and is gradually overtaken by metal growths. The salaryman's girlfriend, again played by Kei Fujiwara, tries to quell the salaryman's concerns as he sprouts a giant metal dog, only to be cut down. In short order, the metal fetishist who started all this madness, played by Shinya Tsukamoto once again, arrives and dukes it out with the salaryman, resulting in their transformation into a single organism. The most striking addition to Tetsuo compared with Phantom is the fetishist's version of a new world, as it is blatantly spelled out early in the film. This new world is perhaps best described as a marriage of man and metal. It is, in short, Tsukamoto's embodiment of the post-human experience. The more fascinating part is how and why we get to this new world. The post-human experience serves as a reaction to all the human anxieties existing in contemporary Japanese society, specifically the stresses of the busy salaryman lifestyle. The salaryman is away from home, visibly distressed. When he's back at home, his fears from lacking human contact manifest in the form of nightmares and the inability to effectively communicate with his significant other. As in Phantom, the woman with the metal claw may be a representation of anxiety, specifically the anxiety that accompanies human interaction in the age of electronics. The salaryman is clearly stressed before meeting her, and when presented by her, runs like hell to escape. Her mutation is something he fears, both because she offers a threat to him and because he doesn't wish to become like her. He flees only to find that his lifestyle as a salaryman, distant from other humans, has already doomed him to a post-human existence. In turn, by giving in to this anxiety and by embracing the technology mandated by modern times, the salaryman undergoes a metallic transition, which is exemplified most poignantly by the metal drill penis. This may well be his punishment for the faults of the salaryman and his ilk, that they have at least been complicit in pushing humanity to the point in which we observe it, and that this is the reward they may reap. As explored in our video on Tokyo Decadence, this time period, the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, was the time when Japan's economic bubble burst. Rampant development and expansion of the country's economy led to an opulent lifestyle for the middle and upper classes in metropolitan Japan. Just after Tetsuo was released, this came crashing down, leading to a near collapse of the market, increasing unemployment, and leading to roughly two decades of turmoil for Japan's working class. This is important in understanding Tetsuo, because it was during this period of rapid growth that the salaryman was first conceptualized. Before long, the idea of the salaryman was cemented as a part of modern Japan. These men committed themselves to their employers, working overtime frequently, and more or less marrying their jobs. Comparatively, today the salaryman is in decline thanks to the changing of the market and the interests of the younger working class. At the time of Tetsuo's production, however, Shinya Tsukamoto was calling attention, as was Ryu Murakami in Tokyo Decadence, to the veneer of opulence constructed by the economic growth from the 1960s through the 1990s, and the less savory aspects of it. If we assume this interpretation to be true, concerning Tsukamoto's interest in the economy and the pain it caused at the time, there are two readings we can glean about the thematic purpose of the salaryman's drill dong. First is that the salaryman can't even enjoy sex anymore. He's given up all parts of his humanity other than the strictly physical, consigning himself to an office job, subjugating his mind to the corporate structure. In taking away his ability to have sex, the mental transformation has removed his last holdout as a human. Alternatively, it could be a statement on how even his humanity, and more specifically his sexuality, is tainted by his station in life. The luxury that is afforded through living in the big city and having a well-paid salaried job has in turn destroyed both him and those around him, as is seen in his metal dong killing his girlfriend. The post-human transformation is not exclusive to the salaryman, of course. In fact, before him there was another to ascend into post-humanism that being the metal fetishist. In flashback, his doctor explains the fetishist's injury, saying that he now has chunks of metal in his brain thanks to a car accident. The doctor coos about how unique this situation is. Through the adversity of the injury, the fetishist evolves. His cells become metallic, giving him powers akin to Magneto. His new metal cells are something yet to be observed in humanity, meaning that he has powers never before seen. Also, as a side note, we couldn't help but notice how much his brain metal makes him look like Vic Boss from Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. We know Hideo Kojima is a big movie fan, 
and we can't help but wonder if this was an intentional nod to Tetsuo. The fetishist also holds something else over the salaryman, that being that he is infectious. In fact, it appears that the metal fetishist is the one helping push the salaryman along in his transformation. It would seem that the post-human modes of procreation are not sexual, but rather viral infection and molding together. We see early on that the salaryman's metal infection is a new one, rather than stemming from the greed and corruption of the system under which he lives. He cuts himself shaving, from which a small sliver of metal erupts. This, in turn, is exploited by the fetishist, who expedites the salaryman's transformation into a metal monster. The fetishist's actions throughout Tetsuo are reminiscent of this opening scene, in which we see the fetishist inserting a metal rod into his human leg. This action, in turn, sets ablaze the paper athletes in his room. He has evolved beyond those paper-thin humans and becomes something more. In turn, the fetishist becomes the metaphorical rod, which is then shoved into humanity at large. All throughout the film, the technological aspect of the new world is shown alongside this metal aspect. For instance, flashbacks are shown through recordings on television, perhaps indicating that our reliance on external technology for human functions, like memory, is already turning us into post-humans. This is further shown in that the television is always on in the house. Sometimes it shows static, other times, clips from the Phantom of Regular Size speed by. For the most part, however, we use the television to examine the fetishist's memories. At first, not even realizing what we're witnessing, we see the car accident that crippled him, the subsequent friskiness that occurred between those who hit him, and then the doctor's visit. This allows us an eye into his mind, providing a visual record where in a human sense we might expect anecdotes or hearsay. His post-humanism has allowed the fetishist to become stronger in memory, this also allows the salaryman to understand him better. At the height of this action, the fetishist smashes the salaryman with his own TV, giving him the memories of his past, and transporting the salaryman into his vision of a new world. This peculiar take on the function of television and video displays a connection between technology, the future, and the past. It shows us how technology improves our memories, our strength, our communication, and even our sex. This might not end up well for the salaryman's girlfriend, but it certainly helps the salaryman and the fetishist in the end when the two conglomerate into a single being. Technology is able to remove their loneliness and their miscommunications, resulting in a more perfect harmony between the two beings. This isn't to say that Tsukamoto is taking a stance on post-humanism with Tetsuo, merely that he is observing several potential implications of it. Does this film bolster or condemn the idea of post-humanism? That's up to you to decide, ultimately. The film provides enough pain, strife, and cohesion for arguments either way. The sexual relationships of the film also perhaps express a sense of disconnect, or at least anxiety, between the various characters of Tetsuo, with each pair acting differently. The salaryman runs into the bathroom when his body transforms and his metal dong first emerges. His girlfriend, attempting to comfort him, states that nothing bothers her. Very quickly, this takes a turn for the worse. She is attempting to be supportive, and yet for one reason or another, he can do nothing but hurt her. It's almost a Jekyll and Hyde situation. He's his true self when not around his girlfriend, but is possessed by the fetishist when near her. Attempting to maintain his autonomy, the salaryman fights back, only to be subdued by the fetishist. This in turn leads to the presentation of homosexual undertones between the fetishist and the salaryman. In spite of the salaryman having nearly killed the young man, and having left him for dead on the side of the road, and having had sex with his girlfriend as the fetishist bled out, in spite of it all, the fetishist seems to bear some kind of affection for the salaryman. This is evidenced not just by the seductive manner in which he speaks to the salaryman, but also in the sultry music that plays as the two fuse in their own personal universe. In Phantom, the two share a meal to show their connection, while here, they're shirtless, floating in a void, and making contact. The salaryman is reduced to a drooling secondary head in their final form, yet he still comments on how good it feels to be one. Throughout the film, you may have noticed that a sense of phallophobia pervades the story. First, the salaryman dreams, or rather has a nightmare, about his girlfriend having sex with him using a metal penis. Next, his own dong turns and turns and turns, making the girlfriend take the part of the frightened individual. When you think about the drill dong, the metal rod shoved into the leg, the nightmare about the other metal dong, the friskiness at the scene of the car crash, 
it might seem like Tetsuo is a very Freudian film, though admittedly this phallophobia doesn't seem to still exist when the two merge. Instead, the fetishist half of their creation holds a gun aloft, commanding that they'll go forth and conquer the world. Regardless, it's hard to not notice the close ties here between violence and sex. The salary man and his girlfriend having a car crash that in turn arouses her is of particular note here. This may be a reference to J.G. Ballard's novel Crash, which involves people who experience sexual arousal from the act of car crashes. We can't be sure whether this connection was intended, but it's interesting to consider when you realize that the later film adaptation of Crash was directed by David Cronenberg, one of Tsukamoto's own inspirations. Speaking of inspiration, we would be remiss to go without mentioning where Tetsuo came from and what it led to later on. The film essentially married a Japanese aesthetic with the American and European dark sci-fi of the 1980s and prior. It postdated Death Powder, yet achieved and still retains as much higher level of influence on later cyberpunk and dark sci-fi works. In a strange twist of fate, Tetsuo has become perhaps more relevant today than ever. In our films, our music, specifically with Vaporwave, and even in our video games, we are often given to exploring the future as looking like an updated version of 1980s Japan. As a result, though Tetsuo was very much a product of its time, it has come to possess a somewhat timeless quality. Fascinatingly, though the project was influenced by sci-fi, specifically The Fly, Videodrome, Blade Runner, and Alien, Tsukamoto was completely unfamiliar with cyberpunk at this time. The genre had been kicking around in America for the better part of a decade, yet Tsukamoto was blissfully unaware that this separate movement had created fertile ground for international acceptance of his own film. In the end, Tetsuo helped develop and influence a genre without knowing it. Even today, Tsukamoto says that he doesn't necessarily think of his films as cyberpunk, in his argument, the cyberpunk genre explores periods that come post-destruction, dystopian futures, if you will. By contrast, Tsukamoto sees his films as exploring the period of destruction itself, which is evident in how controlled and centralized the destruction of Tetsuo is. Admittedly, two more films would spawn from this franchise, which might adhere more so to Tsukamoto's view on cyberpunk. We'll have to get to those at some point in the future. For the time being, however, our look at the works of Shinya Tsukamoto has come to a close. Don't let these episodes make you think that the man has only ever produced science fiction projects. In fact, not long after Tetsuo, Tsukamoto began to explore a number of other genres. Influencing science fiction from the 1990s onward has remained one of his major claims to fame, but Tsukamoto in his storied career has gone on to produce many other diverse films, from the crime drama Bullet Ballet, to the exploration of sexuality A Snake of June, to the war film Fires on the Plain, to his most recent the period drama Killing. Check back in sometime when we'll have to take a look at some of the others. Let us know below what you think of Tetsuo, which of Shinya Tsukamoto's films is your favorite, and what your take is on today's film. There's plenty more coming up soon, so be sure to stay tuned here on Cinema Nippon. Cinema Nippon.